It's your open source advocate and I'm back with another video and today I wanted to talk about another way to get remote desktop access. So in the past I've talked about Mesh Central which is an awesome RMM type system. Also R port which is an amazing RMM type system. So those are remote machine management which means really more so you're just managing the machines for someone else, for a third party, for people in your company, just your family, your friends, whatever, but you always have access using those tools you can always access those machines and those devices. I've also shown you remotely in the past, which was truly an amazing open source project. I wish that the developer had stuck with it and kept with it, but you know, he, he has a full time job. I understand that. So he, he sold it to someone else who has kept it open source, but they haven't really done anything with it in a couple of years either. Now, for me, it still functions, but I know some people are starting to have issues with it, especially as the uh, operating systems progress and it, it is not being kept up, unfortunately. Um, I'd love to see somebody, you know, pick it up, fork it and, and take it over and just keep it going because it really is a really great project. But in order to give you something very similar to that, very similar to what I would say is an AnyDesk or Team Viewer or Go to Assist or BombGuard type solution, there is Rust to Desk. I want to say thank you to all of my subscribers and all of my patrons over at Patreon. Seriously, you guys make this so worth it for me to do these videos every week. I really, truly enjoy it. And I just can't say thank you enough. If you're enjoying these videos, subscribe. Let YouTube know that I'm doing a good job by subscribing to the channel. Plus, you'll get notified when I have new videos coming out. And finally, if you're enjoying what I'm doing, give it a like. Just click on that thumbs up. And that way YouTube knows that you like it. And they'll pass it along to other people that might enjoy my content as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you again. Let's get started. And it works on all of these different operating systems, which is great. So it's got Windows, it's got Mac, it's got Linux, basically, is why they're showing the Ubuntu thing instead of the Penguin, I don't know. Um, they've got Android support, and then they've got iOS support as, the, as the, the system that can view the other machines. I'm pretty sure I don't think you can view an iOS device. That's kind of an Apple thing, not really a, a Rust desk thing. So they've got some really cool stuff here. Uh, and then when you've got the, the Rust S server set up and running, you basically see that, uh, you know, you allow somebody in just like you would with TeamViewer or anybody else, and you can view and take actions on their system. So it, it's really cool because you can set this up to be, I already have the password and I'm going to allow myself to access it anytime I want. You can set this up to be, I have a family member who needs some support. So they, I tell them, hey, go download the Rust S client. You just send them a link and they install it. And then when they open it, they get a, a number, an ID number, just like you would in TeamViewer or AnyDesk, and they get a password. So they tell you the ID number, and then you can say connect, and it'll prompt you for a password. But while you're waiting on their side, it also shows that they can just accept you to connect, which is great. So you don't have to have the password. They don't have to try to tell you the password. They can just accept you knowing that you're trying to connect to their machine at that time, which is pretty awesome. So I think that's awesome. They've got GitHub community, Discord community, and a Reddit community. And then they say that currently they are trusted by OSSC and Lenovo, which are some pretty big names. That's pretty impressive to know that people are using this for that stuff. Um, I think it's pretty great. With Linux, it does not support Wayland. It only supports X11. So if somebody's using the Wayland um, system for showing their screen and their desktop, you'd have to have them switch that to X11. That could be a little bit more work, and just depending on if they're an experienced user or not, that could be not great. I hope in the future that this is going to continue and that they will, in fact, push this to to actually support Wayland as well, because with Pipewire and things like that, there's some really great ways for that to happen. The important part for me is that my, my data is going through my servers, and I have control over that. So what I've set up is I've gone to DigitalOcean, I set up a droplet, and I called it rust.routemehome.org, and then I own the domain for routemehome.org. So in my in my domain, I went out and actually set the IP address as an A record, and you can see it right here. So I created an A record here, and, and just GoDaddy, and you would do this anywhere. So if you want to do it, you click on Add. Most of them have a similar workflow. You choose the type of record you want. In this case, we want an A record. And then I just type in Rust, because it already knows that I'm working on uh, this this domain, which is routemehome.org, that I own. And then you put in the IP address that you got from, in this case, DigitalOcean. Now, the reason I'm saying DigitalOcean is because this is a relay server. You can do this inside of your home network absolutely for certain, as long as you can forward certain ports to the machine that you're running this on. And that's ports 21115 through 21119. So that's 21115 through 21119. Um, those have to be forwarded to your... Uh, machine that you're running that on through your firewall or your router and then things can connect to your relay like they're supposed to. 
So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. But we're going to do this in DigitalOcean because I'm going to use a $5 droplet to set it up and we'll see how it runs. Uh, it may run with no problems at all. It may have a little trouble. We'll just find out. But we're going to use Docker. So um, I've got my IP address for my droplet right here. I'm just going to copy that. And I should be able to go to it through domain name as well. We're going to open up a terminal. And I'm going to make the font a little bit bigger for the people on the mobile devices. So if you're watching on your mobile device, hopefully it will make it easier for you to see. And we'll make this full screen. Um, I don't know if I need it that big. Let's let's make this one smaller here. There we go. So I'm going to SSH root. Now it always sets it up as root on DigitalOcean. And we're going to go to rust.routemehome.org. Let's just see if it's already got it. Yeah, it does. Cool. And then I put my SSH keys, so it's not going to prompt me for a password or anything, which is great. And the first thing I want to do is actually install Docker and Docker Compose because this thing uses Docker and Docker Compose. So I'm just going to pull this down for a second. I'm going to go out to my GitLab. So I have this out on GitLab.com. All right, so I've got this set up in here, and I've got this nice little uh, system called Docker Installs. And I'll leave a link in the description and in the show notes so that you can find this really easily. But I've basically created a script that goes and it installs Docker for you and it does everything that you need it to do. In fact, it even runs the update process on your Ubuntu systems. Now, I can't say that it does that for CentOS or anything like that. But if you want to have an updated system, I suggest first, because it takes longer if you don't do this. So I'm going to do, su I'm going to do um, add user Brian. I'm going to create a new user here. So I'm going to use add user. It's going to prompt me for a password. So I'll use that. That's fine. Now, I'm also going to push my keys over to Brian here in just a minute, but that's okay. I'll do that and, and show you kind of how that works. So my full name, you can just hit enter through all these. You don't have to fill them in and then hit yes right here. So next we want to add our user to the sudo group. So we're going to do user mod and then space hyphen little a capital G sudo. That's the group we want to be added to. And then the user or users you want to add to that group. So you could put multiple users if you knew uh, a lot of different users you wanted to add to sudo. In this case, it's just me. I'm going to leave Brian. There we go. I'm added to that group. So now that we've added my user to the sudo group, I also need to add my keys from the root user to my actual user. So I'm just going to do uh, scp dot slash ssh uh, dot ssh, I believe, um, star to slash home slash Brian slash dot ssh slash. So I don't have a directory there yet. So we'll go to cd. We'll go to mkdir dash p make directory and this is going to be slash home slash Brian make sure we spell that right dot SSH all right and then we're going to do that SCP command one more time or actually just a CP command we don't need to do SCP um, yeah. there we go now I should have the keys in my user directory but I need to add the permissions to it so I also need to give myself ownership of those keys so I'm going to do CHOWN hyphen space or hyphen capital R sorry slash home slash Brian slash dot ssh and we'll just hit enter oh yeah who is it for there we go so it should be chown so change owner and then recursive which means all the way down through this folder and everything inside of that folder and then who do we want to give it ownership of brian is the user brian is the group and then the ssh keys will be in there there we go so now we can do exit and we'll do SSH back to that same thing. And instead of root, we're going to use our new username. So whatever you made your username, you do the same thing. And it just logs in with the keys. That's great. Makes it really easy. I don't have to worry about anything. I guess if I put clear, there we go. Now I'm going to do two things. Uh, actually, I'm going to do one thing. We do nano docker, uh, nano install docker dot y dot sh. So I'm going to create this file called install docker dot sh. It's going to be empty for now. We're going to go back over to my browser and I'm going to go and grab this install docker and proxy man sh and you don't have to do it that way but I'm going to go over here and I'm going to open up the raw. I'm going to hit control a to highlight everything control c to copy and then I'm going to go back over to my terminal. I'm going to do control shift and v like victor to paste into the terminal. I'm going to save that. I'm going to exit and now I'm going to just change the uh, permissions on this thing. So chmod plus x install docker.sh, which means makes it executable. And then we'll run it with dot slash install docker.sh. It's going to come up, and the first thing my script does is it says, let me see if I can tell what this is. So it knows that it's Ubuntu, it's 2004, so you can look at that to make sure release 2004 and it's focal. 
down here I give you choices. So number four is Ubuntu 2004, 2204. I don't know why I have it twice, but there you go. Oh no, sorry, 2104 and 2204. Yeah, there we go. So we're going to hit four and enter. And it's going to ask, okay, if you want to install Docker and Docker CE, if you want to install Docker CE, you have to have Docker, Com I'm sorry, if you want to install Docker Compose, you have to have Docker CE. If you want to install any of these things, just hit Y as, as the prompt here. And we're going to put in our password for our pseudo user. Yes, I want Docker CE. Yes, I want Docker Compose. I don't think I need Nginx Proxy Manager in this case because I've already given this the host name and I've pointed my A record right to this host. Now, if it was inside of my network running on a different machine, I would probably want to use Nginx Proxy Manager to proxy over to it. So you might say yes if you don't have that already installed somewhere. Navidrome I don't need, speed test I don't need, and Portainer CE is kind of up to you. In this case, I'm not going to install it because I don't need it, but you might want it if you're running a bunch of other stuff on the server that you're setting up. But we're going to hit enter, and it's going to go out, and it's going to try to run the updates on my system. And this is going to take a little bit because I haven't updated this system yet, so it's got to run all of the updates for uh, basically Ubuntu. So it's going to take a little time. We'll let it run, and then we'll come back whenever it's finished. So I do add your currently logged in user to the Docker group also as part of the script. That just makes it so you don't have to type sudo every time that you run anything for Docker. Um, it's up to you if you want to use that or not, but uh, you do need to log out and back in in order to get it to take effect. Um, there's some other ways to try to get around that, but I usually just, just exit and then just log right back in. And we'll just clear that out. And if I do Docker PS, you see I don't have to type sudo and I get the information that I would expect. Of course, I don't have anything running right now. So I'm going to make a directory. I'm going to call that Docker. And then I'm going to move into that directory. And then I'm going to make one more directory. and I'm going to call it Rust Disk. And I'm going to CD into that directory also. Now, so when you come to the page, there's this link that says self-hosting here. You just want to click on that. It's going to take you over to here. Um, I'm going to go to the download. That's going to take us over here to GitHub. And they've got some binaries if you want to grab those things, but I want to do this in Docker, so I'm going to go back to their code. I'm going to look for Docker Compose, which they have right here. And then again, we can click on Raw. I'm just going to do Control A to copy, Control C, or Control A for all, Control C for copy. And then we're going to go back over here and we're just going to do nano docker hyphen compose dot yml control shift v like victor to paste that in and then we're just going to scroll up here and we'll kind of look at what they've got so it's version three they set up a network called rust desk net which is fine it's external says false it's not an external network it's just a network internally for the different pieces to talk to each other the services are hbbs and the container name is hbbs that's great that's one of the relay servers the ports that it needs open are 2115, 2116, 2116 UDP, and 2118. So on these, I did, uh, I just did everything TCP UDP. When you forward it on your home network, you can do that. You don't have to. Uh, this one specifies UDP, so these others you can assume are TCP only. But just be aware of that, that you, you do need to set those up correctly on the forwarding if you're going to use this on your home network. The image is from Rust Desk, Rust Desk Server Latest. And then it sets up a command, HBBR. And you see here it's got this uh, this name, so we're just going to change this to be rust.routemehome.org in my case. In your case, you would use whatever domain you have and whatever you set up as the subdomain. Just make sure to leave the 21117 out there. Then the volume's already set to be in this folder with the dot slash HBBS. I like that, so I'm going to leave it. Network is rustdesk.net and depends on HBBR, which is the next piece. So on the next section, it's HBBR. The container name is HBBR, and then here's two more ports, 21.117 and 21.119. So if you change these on the left side, that's what you need to basically port forward on your, on your home router is the left side. So if you change these, you can change these if you want to map these on the host to something else. If your host is already using these for something else, you, you can definitely change these. Just be aware of that. But you need to set up your port forwarding correctly to the, to the number on the left side of the colon. Then it uses their Rust Desk server uh, latest information, HBBR is the command, and then it's in the dot slash HBBR folder, and then it says rustdesk.net, or dash net is the network again, and then it start restarts unless stopped on both, so that's good, that's what we want. There's really nothing here that we need to change per se. Again, if you need to change these ports for some reason, 
because you're already using one of these ports, you can change the left side here. You just need to make sure that when you route that through your firewall or your modem, uh, your router, that you use the correct port that's on the left side there. That's really the, the extent of that. We're going to use Control O to save. And the reason I use Control O, somebody said, hey, you can just use Control X and then hit enter and it'll exit. I'm like, yeah, I can, but I use Control O because I'm a person who saves a lot as I go. So as I'm making changes in longer files, I use Control O to save and that keeps me in the file and I can keep making changes. So that's the reason I do it. Uh, once we've, once you've done Control O we, and enter, we can do Control X to exit and we don't get prompted. So we're good. Now we're going to do docker hyphen compose up dash D. We're going to let this go out. It's going to pull down the things that it needs real quick. It's going to tell us two duns, and we can do docker compose logs dash F. And we'll kind of see the logs that it's got going. And we can kind of check to see, do we see any errors, any issues? No. And it does not take long for this to get started. It starts up pretty fast, so it's already in the start state here. We can see that on the last line of the docker compose logs. We can use control C to exit those logs. And our server is running. All right, I've shown you how to install and set up the server. Now the next part that's really important is you want to set up the clients. Now you really just go download the clients from the rustdesk.com site. Now they have clients for Linux, Mac, Windows, iOS, and Android. Now I don't believe that means you can control your iOS device. I think maybe you can control your Android device, but iOS has rules against being able to, to share your screen like that. Uh, maybe they've changed it uh, since I've last checked, but I don't think so. But for Linux, uh, Mac, and Windows, you should be able to get the Rust Desk client and install it. And in order to use your server, because out of the gate, when you first install it, it's using their servers. And this little ready uh, symbol down here is really kind of what shows you that it's using the servers and ready to go. And you can see I've already set this up and I've connected to my other machine uh, here at the house, physical machine. Um, here's my ID. And then you get a password. And I'll show you the password because I'm going to change it after this video. Uh, but there's the password. And really what you want to do is you want to click on this little three dots and then down here there's this ID relay server and you're going to click on that and right here you'll put in the address of your server. Now you're not putting in anything with ports, you're not putting in HTTP or HTTPS, nothing like that. It's just the, the subdomain and domain of your server. And then if, if everything is running on the same server the way that we've set it up, you don't need to fill in these other things. Now this key field, you might be going, well, what is that? So when you create the server, it does generate a special key, an RSA key, basically, that you can set up. Now, when you set that up, you can go get that off the server, and it's inside of a certain folder, and it's in the documentation for Rust Desk, so I'll link that in the description in the show notes. I'm not going to do it here because it's a little beyond the scope of what we're doing, but you basically put that key in, and you need to set up that key as well for your server. So there's a special flag you need to put in place when you're running that command on the on the on the Docker Compose stuff, um, and it's in the documentation. You just change the command on the Docker Compose. But when you put in that flag, which which is like a dash K, it says force the key. Now, if you say force the key, the only devices that you're going to be able to connect to are the ones that have this key in it, which means you're going to have to share your key with anybody else that you want to use Rust Desk with. Now, if you're using this just for yourself and just to access your own devices, then that may be something you want to set up. But if you're using this for your family, for your friends, you know, things like that, where you're trying to help them with computer issues, which is what I do all the time, and what I imagine most of you kind of have in mind for a tool like this, then you don't want to set that key up in this case because it's, it's going to make it very difficult for you to provide that to those people now. With Windows clients as well, you can run the Windows client. Um, basically, you can change the file name of the executable to have your stuff pre-configured, so it's a little bit special. On Linux, they expect that you can tell somebody how to open this with the three dots and fill in the right information or, or send it to them to paste in whatever. Um, and then you can connect to them. But for the Windows client, you can create your own version of the EXE and put in the configuration so that you can connect and they don't have to set this up. It'll connect to the correct server and that kind of stuff. So they're making it a little bit easy for the Windows people. But so this is how you set it up. So again, if you set it up the way I have, you just put in the, the URL and it'll, it auto, it, it just determines like, oh, well, you didn't fill these in. So I'm going to assume it's the same address and I know what ports to use for this. So once you've done that, you click OK and you should get this ready symbol. If you don't see ready down here after you click OK, if it, if it changes and doesn't change back after a few seconds, you've done something wrong. Double check your URL, 
make sure your server is actually running, go check your Docker compose logs, things like that. But once you do, then you want to install the client on a couple of systems. So I've got a system back here to show you how to set it up on a on a on a Linux uh, system. Now this is a Ubuntu system, but they have RPM, they have they have all kinds of things for all the different machines. I've requested an app image because it would be great to have this as a portable app on the Linux side. An app image basically just installs on any Linux system because it brings all of the dependency stuff with it. It's it's not like a flat pack where flat pack actually installs some extra stuff on your system. It's not like a snap where snap has to be installed on the system first or flat pack has to be installed on the system first. App image is really great because there's nothing special that has to be installed on that system. You just Stick the app image on there, make it executable, and start it. It's really cool. So I love app image stuff just for that reason. I'd, I'd love to see them make an app image out of the client, but that's neither here nor there. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to rustdesk.com, and right here it's going to show you, like, here's all the things that you can get applications for, but it usually just determines what you need. So I'm just going to say download, and it's going to go and download the file that I need, and it's a .deb file because this is running Lubuntu, which is LXQT, I believe, um, now remember, Wayland, they don't support Wayland. They say it right on their site. So if you have a Wayland-based system, you need to switch that to X11 if you want to use Rust Desk with it. Um, really, right now, I think GNOME is the only one that uses Wayland out of the box. So it, you know, if you're not using GNOME in the background, you should be fine. I've set all my stuff up on KDE. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go find the terminal, and I'm not as familiar with... Let's see, I guess Qt Terminal is what I'm looking for. Yeah. So we're going to CD into downloads because that's where it went. And I'll just do an LS. There it is. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to say sudo dpackage dash i or hyphen i and then rust desk. And we're just going to tab so it fills that out. And this is the first part that we need. So we're just going to hit enter. We're going to put in our super user password here. And you do have to be super user to install software. That's that's normal on any system. Even on Windows these days, it asks you like, are you an administrator? OK, cool. And if you're not, then you can't do it. So if you get this dependency problems, this is this is okay. Do sudo apt install hyphen f, which is basically just go and install all of the things, which means fix our fix our problems, fix our dependency issues. So we're gonna let it do that. It's gonna tell us, okay, I'm gonna install a few things here. We're gonna say yes and let it run. So we're gonna go back and we're gonna run the dpackage i. Here we go. Now, if you don't get any errors the first time you run the dpackage command, you may have already had everything that it wanted installed. You might have already had Python, pip, curl, because you may have installed other things that needed that as well. So it, it could totally come up that you didn't need this installed that way. But that looks like it ran correctly, so we'll just exit out of the terminal. Now we're just going to go here and we'll type in rust. And there it is, so it comes up as Rust Desk in our menu. Now, depending on how you access things, you may have to do something a little different. Here's my ID. And then here's my little password. I'm going to destroy this afterwards. But if you just hover the little the little eyeball, it shows you the password. You can edit the password right here if you want to. And then you can even change your ID, actually. So you get quite a few options right here. So you can enable the keyboard and mouse. So these are things you can turn off if you don't want somebody being able to access your system and do anything with it. Um, you can enable the audio input or mute it. Again, change your ID and relay server. So if you look here, it says ready. But right here it says, for a faster connection, please set up your own server. So they're even telling you, set up your own server if you want to have this really be performant because theirs are public servers and they could be used by tons of people and it could have some bandwidth limitations and things like that. So we're going to go in here to our ID Relay server. And again, I'm just going to type in rust.routemehome.org. And we're just going to hit OK. And you see how it goes back to ready? That means that it's good and it's ready to take connections, which is awesome. I could also make a connection from here if I wanted to, but I'm going to take this number and I'm going to put it into the background. I'm going to take this uh, as well. And we're going to type in that number. So 12968111710. There we go. And we're going to say connect. Now I want you to see what happens in the background when I start to try to connect to this. So kind of watch this desktop back here. It's going to ask me for the password. And there it is. Now it pops up. So if you don't know the password, but you're trying to help someone, it pops up and says, hey, Brian's trying to connect to your system. So if I click back here on this, I'll show you here in full screen. Brian's trying to connect to your system. Do you want to allow that or decline it? If you click decline, I'll show you what happens here on the front. And it's going to tell me like, uh, yeah, they said no. So you just click OK. 
Now that doesn't mean you can't try again because maybe they clicked the wrong button. That's okay. So again, you just put in the information, hit connect. It's going to try again. And again, it's going to pop up and say, do you have the password? And if you don't type in the password pretty quick, again, this pops up and they can decline. They can disconnect you at any time as well. So I'll show you what that looks like here in a minute. But I'm just going to say accept and you're going to see this screen pop open. And here we are. So we're connected back there. So I'm just going to widen that out. Now it's as big as it's going to be, but I'm going to change the setting here. I'm going to say stretch just so it fills the screen because the resolutions are a little bit off, but you can see what's going on now. If I try to do anything inside of the client's Rust desk system, I can't. You see that it blanks it out. So it knows that this is my mouse remotely accessing the system and it says, hey, you can't, you can't do anything here. I think that's pretty cool. Now they still have, if you go down here, they still have this open. Now, if I click disconnect, it doesn't work. Again, it knows that that's my mouse. It won't let me disconnect myself this way. I have to do it by closing this window. And then the client can say, you, you know what? You don't have access to this anymore. Now there's some pretty cool stuff the client can control, but you can also send them a message. So if I click up here in the messaging, I can say, I need to control the mouse for a moment. And you see here on the background, they get that message. Now they can reply, but I can't reply from here because again, it knows this is my input device. So if I type anything and I hit send, you see it doesn't show up. It also doesn't show up over here on my side where I'm trying to control things. It only shows my message. So if I go back through my Firefox interface here though, and I type a message and I say, okay, no problem. I can send it, you see it shows up there and then it also shows up here oh, if I get it to set right there we go uh, it also shows up here now I can I can chat with this person I can control their screen I can do the things that I need to do and I can kind of support this person through whatever issue they're having and of course you can minimize this out of the way it's no big deal um, and I can totally control the screen so this is through a, you know this is through my network this is not across the internet specifically but it is kind of because my relay server is out on DigitalOcean so it's going out and coming back in now I don't know if this creates a peer-to-peer -peer connection or if it always has to go through the relay server but it's pretty fast I mean I'm, I'm not really doing anything special here if we go down to let's just go to internet let's open up Firefox um, now this takes just a second it's just a VM that I'm running with some low resources here but now if I go to, let's see, here it is right here, Shortcut YouTube. This is probably the best channel right here. You should always be subscribed to this channel. We'll go check out uh, this one. Now it's probably going to be pretty joppy. Get your products in front of potential customers you get sound. using Shopify social media. So you get an ad. That's great. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it looks okay. It's not exactly perfect, but it's it's not terrible. Um, yeah, and marketplace integrations. Use it. So turn the sound down. You can see the video's pretty quick. Um, yeah, I mean, this isn't horrible actually, so I'm surprised how fast that is. Now again, this is my network. Maybe there's a peer-to-peer -peer connection, so it could be really fast. I don't have a machine off my network to test with, but there you go, I'm controlling another machine. I've got some control options up here as well, so something worth looking at. So you can change from balanced to good image quality, which would slow down the connection. You can go down further for optimization so that it speeds up your connection and your motion, but it may reduce the image quality a bit. Um, I think balanced works and that's just what's set by default. Um, you can say show remote cursor. Now I'm not really sure what that does. I don't know if that changed anything really. I don't feel like it did. I think with Linux, it just doesn't do that. With Windows, I think it does. Um, so if I uncheck it, it looks exactly the same to me. Um, again, you can mute the sound from their side. You can disable the clipboard, so if you don't want things being copied back and forth. And then you can lock the screen after your session is over. So if you say, hey, I need to take control of your machine, maybe it's somebody you work with or something like that, or your family member, they're like, hey, I got to go, I got to go to the grocery store, or whatever. You say, okay, I'll lock it after I'm done. You can click this box, it'll lock the screen after you're finished, and when they come back, they can unlock the screen and, and continue working. So. Pretty, pretty cool, I think. Um, I think that's really great. And as you saw, I, I switched it from the you know original size to stretch, but you can also do shrink. So it just depends on what you want. But if I do original, you see it's really small, um, but it's, this is kind of the original resolution that's running on the VM right now. So I haven't changed that or anything. So you've got a lot of options right there just in the control bar. And then you've got this uh, other option set here. So you can enter Noah's password, you can transfer files, you can set up a TCP tunnel. So if you want to do something with SSH, you could do that as well through the software. 
You can send the Control Alt Delete command if you need to. Now, this would be a Windows only type feature, of course. This isn't going to do much on Linux. You can insert a lock, and of course, you could refresh the screen if something seems like it's not refreshing properly. So, you've got a few controls there as well. And then, of course, we already looked at what you can do here. Now, you can also go full screen. Um, this is pretty full screen already, but if you wanted to get rid of this upper bar and stuff, you can go full screen as well. So really some cool features, I think, here with the Rust S client. Pretty full featured, pretty nice. All right, I'm gonna close this down and I am no longer controlling the screen. I can close the chat window. And then if we go look here, you'll see I'm just back to the screen, but you can see now that I've got that as a saved screen. Now one of the cool things is I can go here and I can say, I wanna rename these devices. So I'm gonna say rename, and I know this is my iMac, so I'm gonna put Brian's iMac. And you see it gets changed over here. Now I can put this as Lubuntu VM, so I can just rename that as Lubuntu VM, and there it is. So it's easier for me to identify these machines, but now I can also reconnect to these machines if I want to. Now if you use the password to connect, you can absolutely jump on and, and do it that way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back over here, I'm gonna go to my other uh, machine here, and I'm gonna open up my Windows uh, VM, and I'll show you guys what it looks like to a Windows machine. So again, you can see here that I've got Rust Desk running, and I've got the address right here, which is 7053158. Again, I'll be changing these after the video is done. So we'll just type this in, 7015053. Five three zero one five eight. If I type it correctly, it's definitely going to make a difference. And it says, do you want me to remember this password? So I can check that box, hit OK, and now I'm controlling my Windows machine. And again, you can see that I can't do anything inside of the box because it knows that's my remote cursor. But I've got the same options that I had before, right here across the top. And of course, I can chat. And then down here, I've got kind of my control area. Now you can see that my Windows screen and this screen are about the same. So that's where this kind of comes into play where I say, you know what? Let's uh, let's shrink this a little bit. Uh, not stretch, shrink. There we go. And it tries to fit it within the bounds of what I can work in. Now, if I want to hide this tool toolbar, I can totally take this full screen. And again, you can click on the full screen icon here and it goes full screen. And now I've really got the Windows machine kind of set. Something about full screen, be careful because apparently it just gets rid of everything off your screen and you can't really change back from full screen, so that's interesting. But you've got full control of your Windows machine now and I can go here and I can say, hey, everything looks good. No, no, it doesn't look good. I can click on all the all the functions work. It's pretty fast. I mean, you can see kind of how that looks when I do the, uh, let's, let's open up a few other things here. It's when, oh, hey, there we go. I went off the screen and it came back. Let's open up Edge. I'm not a fan of Edge, but we'll open it. And then let's open up, I don't know what else I have, WordPad, sure. There we go. Now if I click on this thing, there, so that's, that's not bad, right? I mean, we can click on that, we can click back out pretty, pretty quick. I can switch windows pretty quickly. Again, not too hard to do. And when I, you know, as the end user, so I'm going to switch back over to my other machine here. So, so, so if I'm back here and I'm the user that's watching this happen, I'm kind of watching you play with my screen and I say, you know what, I'm, I'm tired of this or I don't like what you're doing. I can come in here and I can say, you know what, you're done, I'm gonna disconnect you. And if I go back now, it shows me, okay, they disconnected you, you're not connected anymore. Now, I've saved the password as my machine so I can just go in anytime. They could, of course, as, a, as an end user, change the password so that the next time you try to connect, it's not going to work. So there's some safeguards for the end users. There's some safeguards for you as a person trying to provide support with somebody who doesn't understand. They can't be moving the mouse while you're moving the mouse. But um, I think it's really great. I think this is a cool system. Uh, Rust Desk, it looks really great. And, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, like, subscribe, tell your friends about it so they can come along on the journey with us. And I'll talk to you next time.